know, it's great to see you again. Thank you all for having, oh, inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm not. I'm gonna try to stay in time because I need to go to the hospital. Unfortunately, it's almost ten o'clock here. So uh, let me just start. Uh, Donald told you that it's a paradigm shift because not only because of carbon implants, but also because of the intraoperative radiotherapy. This will be the first time ever we show this data in the States. We just showed it in Barcelona and uh, yesterday in the German uh, spine meeting. So I'm really excited about that because this, I think, is a real game changer because we don't have to do radiotherapy for you know weeks after surgery. The problem with the spinal metastasis is, uh, you know, changing because it's not a highly palliative case anymore. Most of these patients are living for years and years now. So as you all know, 60% of the um, cancer patients will have metastasis of the spine. And now we need to address spinal stability as a long-term issue, not in a highly palliative session. And this is one of the papers in oncology showing you that, uh, for example, in metastatic breast cancer, patients are now living much longer than they did 20 years ago. And most of them are reaching the two, three, four years um, mark now. And again, it's a long-term issue now and not only high palliative care where you can just do palliative decompression and hope for the best. These are really highly complex cases you need a, a really good oncologist, you need a really good radiation oncologist, and in some cases, even best supportive care um, and uh, other uh, disciplines. But our main issue is the spinal stability of spine surgeons or neurosurgeons or orth orthopedic surgeons. And this will be you know, the main uh, talk. Uh, how, how to address these patients, when to do surgery, when to do best supportive care, and if surgery, how extensive, is not really easy to answer because all of what we were trained with, all the um, prognostic scores we were taught as residents uh, are not applying anymore because they were these were all built 10 to 30 years ago, um, you know, based on retrospective surgical studies from Tomita to Kohashi and Bauer, modified Bauer, all, all of those. This was one of the first papers looking at these prognostic factors and seeing if they are still applicable in you know, modern day spinal oncology and they are not. Here you see the predictive value of these, you know, most of the scores we have today, uh, ranging from 50% to 72%. So not really anything you can do uh, use on daily, um, you know, on daily practice. So what to do? We have the NOMS framework was published a few years back. It's simple. You need to look at these four aspects and for neurology, um, you know, neurological compromise, epidural compression, obviously, O for oncological response, which is not really easy because most of the oncologists don't know the oncological response for a given treatment because now we all have these all new targeted therapies, new, uh, new uh, receptor treating uh, and, you know, complex uh, treatment uh, op uh, options, which are known only after the patient is given the treatment. So you don't really know the response to that in the first few weeks. And for mechanical stability, which is easy for us, not so easy for other disciplines. That's why we have the SINSCORE now teaching the non-spine surgeons how to address spinal stability. And as for systematic disease here, again, you need oncologists and radiation oncologists to tell you when not to have surgery on the patients because he's basically gonna die within three weeks. But in most cases, we really, we really don't know what the prognosis is. We really don't know and the Oncologist doesn't know if the patient's going to survive four weeks or three months because most of these cases um, are coming as an emergency and you don't really have all the information you need. This was published in uh, 2017 in The Lancet, really one of the nicest and best papers on how to address these kind of patients. They give us an algorithm which looks complicated, but it's not really that complicated. When the patient comes in, you need to look at... Um, life expectancy and uh, functional outcome. So Karnofsky, this is KPS is Karnofsky. If he's um, basically not dying within a few weeks, then you have to give treatment if he is don't. And the kind of treatment starts with the spinal stability. If he's unstable, you need to do instrumentation surgery. If he's stable, you have a plethora of many, many treatment options, including vertebroplasty. I just wanted to emphasize this because we still have the ongoing discussion that putting cement in the vertebra will make the spine stable. Well, it will, it will not. Definitely will not. It's not a stabilizing um, 
procedure. So if the spine is unstable, you need to do instrumentation surgery. For the problem in most centers and probably in most countries is that spinal stability is not nothing, it's not anything an oncologist can assess or a radiation oncologist for that matter. So that's why the SIN score is very valuable for us, not because we need it, but because you can give it to a, a non-spine surgeon to him to learn how when he should call you. So when I took over the new department uh, almost three years ago, the concept of spinal stability was not present. So patients were having only radiation therapy, were collapsing, having paraplegia, and the people just didn't know because when the patient is collapsing after six months of radiotherapy, he's coming in in the emergency department, becoming a surgical patient, and the radiation oncologist that just didn't know. So when I took over, we just applied the SIN score and told them that there is something like the SIN score, which is uh, basically uh, an expert opinion to that time. It wasn't really not validated in many countries. So that's the first thing we had to do in my hospital. We took all patients in 2018 that already had radiation therapy alone and showed and uh, wanted to know what happened with these patients in the follow-up. Primary outcome was fracture progression. You see here that 332 patients had radiation therapy alone for metastatic spine disease, mostly men, median age of 68. SIN score on average was nine, mostly thoracolumbar with a median follow-up of 14 months. So 31 patients had a stable spine, so SIN score below than seven. 30% had a progression of the fracture. Most of them were potentially unstable with 282 patients, 30% had progression. I'll show you what happened with them in a few slides. And the worst cases were the unstable spine with 19 patients having a SIN score below than 13. 32 had a progression of the fracture. So um, happily enough, the stable spine patients had a progression but didn't have any problems or issues, so they weren't referred for surgical treatment. The problem was these potentially unstable spine. 30% had a progression, and 17% had a neurological problem because of that. And even if they did surgery, uh, almost none of them recovered, only one patient. So these are like 31 patients where you could prevent uh, paraplegia with spinal instrumentation. Worse off were the patients with unstable spine, since score above 13, um, almost half had, a pro half had a progression and almost all or all had a paraplegia, sorry. And even if you did surgery, none of them recovered. So now we have data showing non-spine surgeons what it means to have an unstable spine or potentially unstable spine. So we now, in my institution, or at least in Germany, I think, now we recommend for instrumentation if you have a SIN score more than uh, eight, which is really easy for an uh, oncologist to you know, assess and call us when he has a patient with spinal metastasis. Now, um, in my department, they have, you know, a poster with a SIN score and they can call us when they have a SIN score below, uh, above of eight and then we address it in, in the tumor board or in emergency cases alone and assess for surgery, yes or no. Now, to do surgery, we used to do this. Uh, now we should know. Now we know that we should do surgery. Uh, how to do it is a different problem. We used to do open approaches uh, with titanium cages. With that, we had you know complications, mostly wound healing, because all of these patients had adjuvant radiotherapy. And if you do radiotherapy and a uh, previously operated patient, you have a higher rate of um, wound healing disorders. So that's why we need minimal invasive approaches and we need um, also implants that we can use for post-operative imaging, uh, because some of these patients will have a neurological deterioration, and then you need an MRI to see what's happening with titanium. It's not really easy. The first step was easier because we have MIS solutions from almost every company now. So you use tulips, use small incisions, you avoid having big incisions. The second problem is much more difficult with titanium. You always have artifacts, so you needed some kind of new implants where you could do post-operative MRIs and see what happens with the patient is deteriorating. So I use this Swiss company. Um, there are new now two um, companies that do 
carbon peak implants. One is from Israel, the one is the other one's from Switzerland. I use the Swiss one because not uh, not because I'm in Europe, but because it looks like a normal screw. It feels like a normal screw. You can put it in like a normal screw. The other company needed to put it together. It's a little bit cumbersome, and I did, did don't want to you know. It's hard enough to do these surgeries as it is. I don't want to be you know, occupied with how to put the screw together. So this is a carbon peak composite screw, candulated. You can use K-wire for navigation, making it really, really safe and minimal invasive. The benefits of using carbon peak are clear. You have less artifacts. That's why you can do better radiation planning. That's why my radiation oncology is very happy. Uh, you can have better oncological follow-up. It regards us now because the patients now are living longer and they're coming back with local recurrence three, four, five years after primary surgery, which we didn't have seven years ago because basically most of them were dead by then. And also very important is the perioperative complication management. Again, a few of these patients will have a deterioration, then you need an MRI to see what's happening, epidural hematoma or what have you. So we have now a few publications showing that obviously with carbon peak, you have less artifacts. And this you know, uh, translates in... Um, less over or under dosage when you do radiation planning or uh, treatment. Uh, under dosage, not a real problem, but the over dosage part is a problem because if you hit too or you give too much uh, grave to the spinal cord, the patient will have a problem uh, later on. This is one of the first cases in the new department, uh, 50 year, 50 year, two year old otherwise healthy male patients with back pain um, presenting with this, with this ugly MRI. We did a CT, you know, it looks like a metastasis, but he was, you know, healthy, young. So we did CT staging, we found nothing. We did the biopsy just to be sure it was a high grade sarcoma. So obviously you need a new advent treatment for these patients and then on block resection if possible. So after this aggressive chemotherapy regime, um, you see that the tumor shrank. And then this was an Anakin 2B before, now it's an Anakin 1B, so more accessible for unblocked resection, to be honest. So the plan was to do the dosal release, two above, two below instrumentation with carbon peak, and then with a second or second step, same surgery, uh, lateral approach, uh, remove all that unblock, and this is what we did. You see the carbon screws uh, really nicely. We have also carbon peak uh, vertebral body replacement implant. So this was done really nicely. The patient is now three months, three years uh, out. You see, you know, great imaging, like uh, Dr. Johnson said, you know, MRI invisible implants, which it is. You can really appreciate that there's no tumor here. We also did PET CT scans. And three months after, uh, three years after primary surgery, patients really uh, doing well. The axle imaging as well. Uh, but it's not also uh, not only important for primary bone tumors, also for secondary. This is a metastatic case with a known renal cell carcinoma presenting with axial pain. Uh, you see here, this is a um, uh -huh. Yes. Do you have a question, Tony? No, no, I think, I'm not sure where that came from. Okay, so, <laughs> so this is score of 11. So we, again, we did the two above, two below with the carbon peak implants. And he had a radiotherapy of L1 with 30 gray. Comes back three months after, six months after, without any problems, asymptomatic with a new tumor at L3. You can see it on CT scan, you know, uh, around the carbon um, peak screw. So you did an MRI, you see it clearly, and the radiation oncologist was really relaxed. You know, I can see it, I can plan it, there's no artifacts. So he went for secondary radiotherapy only at this, this vertebra because he was able to. Patients comes back a year after, no problems from the spine, but problems from the sacrum. So you see here also in these cases where if you need it, you can also do um, radiation therapy in the augment, uh, segmented, in the instrumented vertebra because it's not titanium. So now we have MIS, we have navigation, we're starting with robotics now because we really want to avoid you know, revision surgeries for these patients. Um, we're using uh, carbon peak implants for the benefit we just talked about. And the next big step is as a, you know, a workflow, as a concept in these patients is uh, intraoperative radiotherapy. 
um, looks like this. I'll show you the first case we did in Augsburg. Basically, this is a device. This was uh, or still is main, mainly used for breast cancer patients. Uh, you know, after surgery, you put this applicator in the breast and do intraoperative local radiotherapy, and then you don't need any postoperative uh, adjuvant radiotherapy anymore. So we applied this also for uh, you know brain cancer, for brain metastasis. Now we have more than uh, almost uh, 99 or 100 cases of uh, cranial brain metastasis treated, which is marvelous because the patient is going home at the fourth, fifth or sixth day after surgery without needing any new, any more adjuvant uh, treatment with regards to radiation therapy. For the spine, this was developed for kyphoplasty plus intraoperative radiotherapy from a place in Germany a few years back. But this didn't stick because it doesn't make any sense to do kyphoplasty and then uh, kyphoplasty, you know, radiotherapy and then kyphoplasty because it's not a stabilizing procedure. And if you have a patient where you could do kyphoplasty, uh, probably you can also do percutaneous radiotherapy because it's not a stabilizing yeah. device. So we took this applicator and wanted to use it for our instrumentation cases. Uh, the neat thing about it is because of the dose depth distribution, at the tip of the needle, you almost have 200 ray. And if you are a centimeter away, you are, you end up you know about seven to eight rays. So it's really, really safe. You have a, a lot of energy in the middle where the tip of the probe is, and if you go uh, outside of it, you, you know, uh, to the direction of the spinal cord, you almost have no radiation anymore. So this is the first case we did. This was, a, I don't know, remember what kind of metastasis you see it here, because it was a SIN score of uh, nine. I decided to do only one above, one below. So percutaneous, we did. Now we do, I don't do like many, many small incisions because, you know, you need one incision for the uh, navigation, four or eight incisions for the screws and then one more incision for the decompression if you need it then you end up with 10 incisions i don't like that anymore we do one small incision for the skin and everything else we do transmuscular uh, so it's still minimal invasive so two above two below and then for the intraoperative radiotherapy we plan it with a you know brain lab planning um how we plan a screw. The screw, to the tip of the applicator should be in the middle. And the radiation oncologist is with me in the OR room telling me where he wants to have it. And we, you know, using a K wire and a tube uh, through the K wire. We then put the applicator inside without connecting to the device. We do an intraop CT. Now we exactly know where the applicator is going to be when we apply radiotherapy. The radiation oncologist with his physics physician, um, physics guy, come to the OR, they do, you know, draw a circle about a centimeter away from the tip of the applicator. In the middle, you have 200 gray here. Um, at the end of the circle, you have um, only eight gray. And for the spinal cord, there's no safety issues anymore. Then you put it in the tube and then leave it in the patient, leave the room for 12 minutes. The guys do their thing with the radiation therapy, and that's it. And you see here, this is the first patient with even with epidural compression before surgery. This is directly after surgery, and three months afterwards, the thing shrinks, and you don't even have any epidural compression anymore. So treatment has evolved from open to MIS, yes. Treatment has evolved from titanium to carbon peak implants, and now we are evolving treatment for the duration therapy from percutaneous to stereotactic and now for intraoperative radiotherapy. So in conclusion, you need to be thinking, uh, you know, think of these patients as a long-term problem, not, you know, only for a few months or a year because they are living much longer and they will be living for uh, much longer now because now all the targeted, targeted therapies are starting to come to our daily uh, lives. And this will change everything for in the next five to seven years. Carbon peak implants uh, are associated with less artifacts, better radiation planning, and better oncological follow-up, as I showed you. And I really do think that the next big step will be the intraoperative radiotherapy, because then we will avoid or even eliminate postoperative uh, wound healing disorders. And at least in Europe, if I do the intraoperative radiotherapy, I get the money for it. So it's a win-win situation for the surgeon. Thank you very much. Ehab. 
Yes. G great, great talk. Uh, I was just curious, if we tried to get interoperative radiotherapy in any of the hospitals I work at, I would think that the red tape would be significant. How long did it take from when you started the conversation to getting it in the OR? I, I just imagine that must have taken some time. It was already in for the OBGYN guys. Uh -huh. So for intracranial application, it's uh, you know not off-label, it's on-label, so it's not an issue. For spine, it's still off-label. You need to talk to the patient separately. So it was already inside. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And, and how many patients have you done with the intraoperative spinal now? Spinal six now. Uh -huh. It just started three months ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. And no um, immediate wound complications, they've all been fine? Yeah, yeah. Great, yeah. great. Yeah. Great, that's great. Uh, Dr. Shiban, uh, my name is Martin Pham. I'm one of the, the spine surgeons uh, here um, stateside. Um, I, I was wondering, when you do these minimally invasive um, stabilizations, uh, do you still wait the two weeks for wound healing or do you allow systemic therapy sooner? Um, because th there's some literature that suggests that since we're doing these minimally invasively now, whether it's percutaneous or, or you know, a single incision, um, the wound healing has been much better. And at least I've started to tell, you know, for very sick people, I I've started to just allow our oncologists to, to continue therapy. So I do it through therapy just because um, the incisions are so much smaller and heal a little bit better. But what's been your experience? Well, now we wait a week. Seven to ten days. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't dare through therapy because um, we do see some issues if they are, you know, if they already had radiation therapy and then they come in with a, a fracture and you need to do surgery, they tend to have a bad uh, wound healing disorder afterwards, uh, or even through chemotherapy. I just would not. But a week, you know, it's fine. Great. Thank you. Dr. Shivan, uh, Christoph Hofstetter here. Uh, fantastic talk, really enjoyed it. Uh, innovative, uh, and that's exactly what we need. My question to you was uh, the example that you you showed that tumor was almost spherical. You know, it was kind of one vertebral body, almost as if you selected it for it. Uh, you know, what would you do it if you have a tumor that spans like two, three levels or has like in involvement of the pedicle? Um, have you? Would you have several brachytherapy? You know, centers then for that. Uh, you know that you do different um, areas, or what? What would be your strategy for more extensive uh, disease? We're not. We're not there any in, in now. This is the, you know the first cases have to be the simple cases, single level, just the feasibility studies, and maybe in a few years when we feel comfortable, we can do more levels. But for now, it's simply one level disease. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Great to see you and uh, great, great technology. Keep pushing the envelope. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care. Thank you.